Uh, hi, so it looks like the sun showed up and we lost some people, but that's cool. Um, I'm going to talk to you guys today a little bit about splay trees. Now, if you know what binary trees are, this might be kind of a refresher for you. You might actually know what these are, that'll be cool. Otherwise, if you don't know, they're a pretty nifty data structure. So, what's the use case for this kind of thing? Um, Specifically, I'm going to be talking about my use case and why I decided splay trees were a good idea for what we wanted to use. Uh, so I'm building this project in my spare time called OlegDB, which is a key value data store in memory. Um, it's optimized for writes. We have kind of an append-only log thing that we just throw data into. I say it's chaotic at best because we are rapidly changing things, and uh, I say it's persistent at worst because we have a pretty high attention to static analysis and code review and all this kind of thing. So specifically, our use case was we wanted something where we could iterate through the key value pairs we have in the database. So Oleg is a hash table, which is great if you want to put stuff in and get stuff back out. But really, you often want to do more and if you can do that in the database versus like you know storing a new key with values that you have in it that you fetch again, um, you do a thing called like cursor iteration where you have a cursor and you jump through your key value pairs and you can pull them out. So this is a pretty common paradigm. Uh, we also have, or we also wanted to do prefix matching. So a common thing that you see with NoSQL key value store database type of things like Redis or Kyoto Cabinet or could name a bunch of others you've never heard of, um, is you have a common prefix for your thing. So like if you have a user and you're inserting that into a user's database, you, or since you don't have tables, you have to prefix your keys. So like user John has a prefix and user Bob has a prefix and all this stuff. And then later on, you can use the prefix matching that you hopefully have in your database to pull everything back out again. And you can split this up as much as you need to for blog posts and tables and comments and all sorts of other stuff if you don't want to nest. Um, and then also sorting. So one of the valuable things, um, especially with trees, is being able to sort things. So for our case, we want to be able to iterate through, like, say, a list of timestamps in the order, not necessarily that they were inserted, but in some kind of order that you can decide later. Um, so that was the use case that we want to use. So why splay trees? Um, they're pretty simple. They're basically binary trees. And you don't have any of the kooky overhead that you have with B trees or B plus trees or red black trees, that kind of thing. Um, our implementation, which I just scraped straight off Wikipedia and ported to C, <laughs> uh, is about 200 lines with some extra stuff on there. Uh, the mental overhead is a lot smaller. So you're not thinking about like, okay, how many nodes are in this leaf node? Do I need to like reorder all this kooky stuff? It's just a binary tree. You have a node, you have things that are less than the node, you have things that are greater than the node. Pretty simple. And we just didn't need any greater data structure than this. Um, and I do want to emphasize that we didn't pre-optimize here. It's very important that you pick the data structure for your need. So like, I made the call to do this one because of the aforementioned. Um, the amortized performance of a binary tree, or uh, sorry, a splay tree is the same as a binary tree. And what I mean by that is, if you don't know what amortization is, it's a way of saying that I'm vastly simplifying this here, um, that even though some use cases are going to be worse, some use cases are going to be better, it, aver it averages the wrong word, but it's akin. It averages out to the same kind of performance as a binary tree. So even though you're doing these kind of expensive splay operations on a tree, which I will get into later, um, you have better performance because you are accessing um, nodes that were most recently inserted. Uh, you also have a couple of different sorting modes. So like if I was inserting a bunch of alphabetized data, you could do your depth first traversal of your splay tree and get like an ordered list of like A to Z, that kind of thing. But you can also do pre-order traversal of your splay tree and get newest to oldest. So you have a couple of different free sorting modes when you do this kind of splay tree thing. So what is a splay tree? A splay tree, ganking again from Wikipedia here, is just a binary tree where the added benefit that inserting nodes puts them to the top, so they're quick to access again. Like if you just inserted some crazy new value, it would be right at the top next time you wanted to find it, if you were doing a lot of finds. Um, just a binary tree plus splay optimization. And um, 
In our implementation, we have left nodes, right nodes, and references to parent nodes. This lets us do a lot of things later, like uh, save memory when traversing the things and a whole bunch of other stuff. But there are implementations where you do top-down splaying, but I didn't want to get into that because it's all you know, papers from 75 and they use single variable letter names and all sorts of stuff like that. And like any good data structure, it was created 30 years ago and forgotten about and then people are bringing it up again. So, splaying. A splay operation can be composed of these three things. And they each have left and right variances. So like, for example, the zig, which I'll get into in a second, just has like a left and a right, that kind of thing. Um, and the goal of each splay of, splaying operation is to get the node to the top of the subtree you're uh, working on. So what this means is if you're splaying like the bottom left of a subtree or some subtree, it'll go to the top, it'll go to the top. So you can just keep applying this operation to get the node to the top of the tree. It'll kind of break down if you try to splay a node that's not in a tree, and I just hope that never happens, but it sounds scary. So the first operation you have is called a zig. A zig is kind of a special case where you have either the, left, the child, x in both of these cases. <coughs> Sorry, this case, this is one case. x is either the left or the right of the root node. And in, you also have an odd number of child nodes. So in this case, you can just rotate. It's about a half rotate and it'll get to the top. So you can see we start out with x and then we splay to the root and everything is still in order. Like you can still traverse this and say a, x, b, p, c, that kind of thing. And it'll still be in order no matter what. You're just kind of yanking the tree around, if you can kind of picture that. The next operation is a zig-zig, where you have a child and a parent that are both the same orientation to their parents. So you have x and p here, which are both left nodes, and then it transforms into you know, x at the top. You basically yank it again until it's the grandparent. This is also the case for the right node. You can see that um, splaying operations like this are basically just a series of applied rotations. I didn't add a bunch in here because it's kind of weird, but all you're basically doing is kind of like pulling it one way or the other. And finally, you have the zigzag where you have a left node and then its child is the right node. So you, again, you kind of do this. And with the added benefit of after doing your rotation, you have a you know, unified level binary tree, which is nice. So insertion is pretty simple. You, like any good data structure, you have to Know, modify these kind of things. But you insert the node as a normal binary tree. So you traverse all the way down and say, okay, it's left. If, it's, if my key is less than this, you go to the left. If it's greater than this, you go to the right and you just go all the way down. But then once that's done, you splay it back to the top of the tree. So you get your, in, your binary tree sorted as normal, but the new nodes are at the top, which is pretty handy. Deletion is pretty similar, but reversed. You splay it to the top first, delete it, and then stitch everything back together. Pretty simple. Finally, there's a couple caveats, of course. Like a good data structure has strengths in one area and weaknesses in another. And of course, the splay tree has some weaknesses. So like any binary tree, if you have a very left heavy or right heavy data set, it's not gonna be as performant as a more heterogeneous data set, like a bunch of names or all sorts of stuff like that. So as a general data structure with heterogeneous data sets, it performs pretty well. Uh, it doesn't have the block size cache hit performance that like a B tree or B plus tree does. So what I mean by that is when you're designing a database that is very disk heavy like they all are usually, um, you want to get as many values as you can in a single hit. And this is because if you're pulling like, um, actually I'm not sure for memory, but if you're pulling for disk usually you get things back in four kilobyte blocks, unless you've fiddled with it or you're running some weird operating system. So you get back four kilobytes at a time. So what you want to do is you pack as much data into a single 4K block as you can. Um, binary trees, understandably, since it's all memory references, you don't get as many back as you would with a B tree or a B plus tree, which are kind of crazy data structures. Uh, and it's still just a binary tree. So People, people saw that the binary tree was awesome, it was elegant, and they improved it by making like, two three trees, two four trees, where you have more than just binary nodes in a single node or a single leaf, that kind of thing. Um, so those are the caveats. And yeah. Uh, so where to go from here? You can, when I started this talk, I was thinking maybe you could splay 
other structures, like could I take a bee tree and splay things to the top? And that just doesn't quite work out as well as you think. Because um, most trees, like bee trees, binary, I'm going to keep coming back to these, by the way. Bee trees, B plus trees, have self-balancing algorithms built into them so that you're never like heavily left or heavily right, that kind of thing. You're very balanced and you have a number of nodes. So the splay operation is effectively just another way to balance a tree, but in kind of a weird way. Um, and looking at, this, looking at this, I actually found splay trees in a Hacker News thread where it's like, what's a bunch of cool uh, little used data structures that maybe nobody's heard of? And um, a couple referenced were the trees, that's tree with an I, where um, you're effectively building like prefix trees. They're commonly used for things like spell checkers and um, spell check, oh, search engines like tokenizers, that kind of thing. And uh, fractal trees are another way of like implementing B trees and B plus trees where you kind of uh, put a buffer zone. So really you have to look at the data structures that you should use um, for any given job that you're applying to, or solving, I should say. Um, that, that would be my main point, is that you have, like don't rely on just, I'm thinking like JSON blobs because I <laughs> heavily work in a web dev background, but like try to pick elegant data structures for your task. Like don't rely on just hash maps and arrays for everything when you could pick a data structure that works well for your needs. So I pick splay trees. Um, and of course I've got some, <laughs> sell myself here. Uh, you can find me on Twitter, my name is Wally or GitHub Q Pfeiffer, and of course the project is OLEGDB. And that's what I got. Can so, you show us the website? <laughs> I can show you the website. So I'd like to be this open source. Oh, yeah. And it's so we can look at Splay Tree code there. You can. Yep. Uh, this is. Use OLEGDB. No, the website is static in a awful templating language that I write that uses what I call the Xbox Live syntax. If you've ever seen like 13 year olds on Xbox Live, it's got, you know, X, 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 triple X kind of thing, because I was sick of curlies. So I wrote my own templating engine for this. And I wanted it to be static, so everything's by itself here. Um, yeah, <laughs> this is the website. I can show you guys in detail if you want to. Can you back up to the third version of Ziggy? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Mayo, it fits. See, we have. All right, so. To have a good software project, we believe you need to have a good metaphor. Like if you look at brew on the Mac, it's centered around you know beer drinking. Or if you look at chef, it's centered around chefs in the kitchen. So we decided to pick the mayonnaise metaphor. So you have a series of jars. You put things into jars. You take them out of jars. To delete, you scoop. To uh, um, expire a key, you spoil it, that kind of thing. So we, we're heavily mayonnaise oriented. So the API naming convention is all these yeah. mayonnaise. Yeah, it's not exactly clear to uh, non-native English speakers, but it's very consistent, and I value that. So then why, why did you go with this as opposed to, say, Redis? Or, or why did you roll your own? It started out as a joke, and then <laughs> it got really serious. Um, we're like, man, this is actually kind of fun. So now it's turned into sort of a learning exercise, uh, also whoever I can trick into using it kind of thing. So I would never say, you know, go out and use my database as a serious object, but it's fun to, you know, try to... Hey, your website says, yes, use it in production. <laughs> <laughs> Four freaking... <laughs> so We're the, effective. The mayonnaise reference, is that inspired by Swedish Mealtime? It's inspired by Oleg Zornitsky, who is the man who holds the current world record for most mayonnaise eaten in the shortest amount of time. It's eight pounds in eight minutes, which is a lot of mayonnaise. <laughs> <laughs> We're very attached to this metaphor. Um, any other questions? Came from? Yeah, that's where the name came from. So the mayonnaise idea came before the, uh, the name then, I guess? Yeah, well, uh, so it started out, we have this IRC bot who will spit out random facts occasionally, and one of them was the mayonnaise fact, and then Oleg started showing up here and there, and we're like, that's a really bizarre name. So then we stuck with it as kind of an inside joke, and then it expanded from there. So, any other questions? All right, Can thanks for your time. <laughs> I'm glad you asked. <laughs> Y'all see that? I was going to resize it, but I don't think that works. Uh, ch -ch -ch -ch. I call it OLEDDB website. So let's look at base here. So I call it Grishunkel because it's a cool phonetic sounding name. No, I don't want to look at this one. I want to look at. So the idea was I build this in the worst way possible. 
Um, so it doesn't use regular expressions. It uses no dependencies either because I didn't value that at all. Um, I actually ported a markdown parser from a PHP, PHP project I found online and used that to parse markdown into blog files. But um, yeah, this is what the, oh, you guys can't see that, can you? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm trying here. And, oh no, you, I don't think you understand the kind of uh, terminal I'm working with here. Here, we can do it in a, I don't know, it's XFCE. So we're gonna go look at the actual site. <laughs> no, see, like I'm, I'm doing, it's just, see it's moving down there. <laughs> yep, Linux, everybody. Uh, just, I use Linux with XFCE, I can do it, I don't know. So we want OLED DD. That's probably my specific situation like any other. Did you write your own terminal? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just, if not, when will you? <laughs> uh, so we want, <laughs> All right. There, it is. there we go. How do you enhance? Enhance more? <laughs> more. Excellent. All right. So as you can see, that's also this is leaked into the website's documentation. So we actually generate documentation from the source code with the same templating syntax. So if you look at the Oleg header files, it's full of this triple X garbage. Um, it's actually pretty advanced. It does, I don't think I have any in here, but it'll do loops, it'll do context dereferencing. It's great. I should probably sell this instead of the database. Um, <laughs> alongside the database. Alongside the database. Really, I'll make a Django alternative that uses this syntax, OLEDDB as the back end, and then just kind of work my way into fame and riches. Riches. <laughs> so, <laughs> there's a lot more of that. I'm also afraid that if it ever breaks, I'll never know how to fix it, because it's horrifying to look at. <laughs> yeah, anything else? Are you, uh, are you using an XML parser to, to parse this? No. <laughs> it goes line by line, and uh, it'll generate a series of dictionaries, variables, and then pass everything around. It's, it was architected in the worst way I could think of, which was to just split so like if I get a line that has triple X's in it, I'll like split on that and then, you know, parse out the rest of it. Anyway. So the splay tree thing, I mean, there was a splay tree. <laughs> um, have, have you benchmarked this with large trees and stuff? I mean, what, what's, what's the largest sort of trees you've worked with with this thing? Well, we've got a series of unit tests that we use it for and we insert, I think, 10 million keys and then delete everything. So those are usually incremental ha uh, keys. So like splaying is relatively simple. So you just like look and it's less than and you insert it, but you end up with a very left-handed tree. Um, it stays balanced though, I mean, on average, right? I mean, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The thing is if you have like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 as your keys, you still end up kind of, and it, if you're well, pivot. It doesn't, it doesn't make a lin linear like list out of them, but it but doesn't balance them perfectly either. The, no. The, I guess the property of the splay tree is that isn't it one of these factor of two things that the shallow sleep, the shallowest sleep is half the height of the deepest sleep? Yeah, something like that. Something like that. So yeah. you didn't talk too much about this splay tree property that like the most recent element is that you added is fast to access. Is that useful for you or? Uh, well, it turns out we actually don't do much finding in our like. My primary use case is I like, like iterate through a series of things with and it, and that's right yeah. Um, and since I'm the only one using it, I pretty much dictate what goes on. But uh, since you splay each node to the top, um, what you end up with is the most recent thing at the top and then the least, the second most recent thing next to that, that kind of thing. So it's actually super useful if you find yourself inserting things and then trying to find them again later. That kind of thing. So. Cool. Yep. Thanks for your time. <laughs> <laughs>